Jofos tend to have broken and busted stands that manipulate time in some way. Zawarodo stops time, Killer Queen bites the dust turns back time, King Crimson skips time, and Maid in Heaven speeds up time. But Funny Valentine's dirty deeds done dirt cheap, or as intellectuals call it, filthy axe at a reasonable price, is the first stand that said, enough of this wibbly wobbly timey wimey nonsense, I want to hop through dimensions. And so, Valentine was given a portal gun. D4C had a bit of an ability change after its initial reveal, x -Force has already gone into great detail describing who shot Johnny Joestar, and while that concept was later Araki forgotted, or Araki didn't forget he just changed his minded, one thing remains constant. When an individual or object from an alternate reality is brought close enough to its original counterpart, both objects will accelerate towards each other, colliding with little sponges, and explode. Valentine is, of course, immune to this ability, as he can instantly transfer his consciousness to another Valentine and swap places if he's ever mortally wounded. So, to determine how this crazy OP ability works, we'll first have to talk about the different branches of physics and determine which is applicable. Once we know that, I can show you how certain interactions show a parallel to how D4C works. And while it doesn't involve sponges, it holds a deeper understanding on how our world is constructed. <laughs> Since its inception, physics has attempted to explain four fundamental forces in our universe. Gravity, electromagnetic, strong nuclear, and weak nuclear. But in the history of civilization, the study of physics hasn't been around for terribly long. Classical mechanics was described by Isaac Newton and co. in the 1600s, using three laws to govern motion in reference frames. James Maxwell's equations on electromagnetism were derived in the 1860s, which showed not only a relationship between electricity and magnetism, but how they move as waves. These governing laws describe the vast majority of events we observe in the universe. But then, there are situations where these laws can't describe certain phenomena. These include the stable atomic model, black body radiation, the photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, and the Frank Hertz and stern gerlach experiments. Accelerating reference frames, which we've covered on the very very first episode of Stan Science were described by Einstein in the 1920s with special relativity. And it's funny because even though he's most well known for that, he received his Nobel Prize describing the photoelectric effect. But now we have the age of quantum mechanics in the early 20th century, pioneered by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, de Broglie, Planck, Bragg, Dirac, and basically the vast majority of early Nobel Prize winners. I'm sure if you're a 900 IQ Megamind Rick and Morty viewer, you've heard at least a few of these names. Each of these individuals could deserve a whole video dedicated to them, but we don't have time for that. What does quantum mechanics really deal with? Well, in essence, it's the study of small particle interactions. While classical physics and electrodynamics are deterministic, quantum is inherently not. This is where Schrodinger's Pansu and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle come into play. And now we have subatomic physics, the logical extension of quantum mechanics, and one of the newest branches physics researchers have been studying. Subatomics tries to answer the fundamental question, what are we made of? It's a question that we think we know the answer to, but the more you know, the more you know you don't know. People are made of flesh. Flesh is made of cells, cells are made of molecules, and molecules are made of atoms, and atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. But what if we were to go even further beyond? The ancient Greek philosophers like Aristotle postulated that the classical elements that made up our universe were air, fire, earth, and water. And while they were right for an alternate reality that is the Avatar universe, they weren't for ours. But they did prove their true genius because they did know it was a few. So what are the particles that make up atoms, and what makes them interact? Our current understanding of the universe says that we are made up mostly of leptons and quarks. Let's start with leptons. I mentioned the electron is a particle that makes up an atom. This should be knowledge from high school chemistry. But when you think about it, an electron is very, very tiny when compared to the proton and the neutron. And I'm talking about mass, because the nucleus of the atom, which contains only protons and neutrons, makes up almost all of the mass, despite being so tiny. The electron cloud makes up the the majority of the space in an atom. So because electrons are so small, they're considered subatomic particles known as leptons. Leptons make up a category of particles that are not quarks, 
basically anything that just isn't a quark for our purposes today. These include muons, tau particles, and the super penetrating neutrino, which holds a special place in my heart, because my very first research position contributed to the search for a neutrinoless double beta decay. All leptons can interact using the weak nuclear force, but neutrinos can't interact with the electromagnetic force. If the leptons are the meat, then the quarks are the potatoes of the subatomic meal. Quarks make up particles like protons and neutrons in groups of three. Quarks are allowed to have different flavors which help them interact with different particles. Up, down, strange, charm, top, and bottom. Quarks only interact and bond using the strong nuclear force. Gravity is mostly excluded in general talks about subatomics because it's honestly the weakest of the fundamental forces. So hopefully now you know where all of the fundamental forces play a role in our universe. And if you want to create certain scenarios for how these particles interact, you can use these drawings known as Feynman diagrams. These little diagrams that describe particle interactions come from the mind of Richard Feynman, an individual who is a bit of an inspiration for many aspiring physicists. Feynman was one of the brilliant men who worked on the Manhattan Project during World War II and received a Nobel Prize for the field of quantum electrodynamics or QED. QED relies on the notion that photons, the particles that make up light, are force carriers, which is kind of crazy because photons don't have any mass. These diagrams can be read viewing one axis as displacement in space between the particles and the other axis as a progression of time. Each diagram shows how a different side of an equation before and after an interaction work. But you will need to conserve a couple of quantities, specifically charge, linear momentum, angular momentum, and lepton number. Hopefully you know what charge is and linear momentum. Angular momentum is just spin, and lepton number is the number of leptons on both sides of the equation. Now with what I've presented so far, you might notice these diagrams don't always work, because charge and lepton number can't always be conserved without one certain concept that holds the key to D4C's ability, antiparticles. At this point you might be thinking we already know everything that makes up the universe. Matter holds all the answers in how particles interact. Or does it? Hey Vsauce! Hey Vsauce! Hey Vsauce! Hey Vsauce! Michael here. If the universe were to continue expanding at the rate it does, it's missing 68% of the energy needed to do it. To account for this discrepancy, scientists have coined the term dark energy, a property of space that allows it to continue expanding how it does. An entity that is completely invisible but also very massive existing in this space is called dark matter, which makes up 27% of that dark energy. If you want to learn more about this, you could always look into cosmic background radiation. Dark matter is oftentimes referred to as antimatter. For most particles, there must be an antiparticle that acts opposite to it, so the laws of conservation hold. Let's go back to the electron. Carl Anderson, the 1936 Nobel Prize winner, discovered a particle that had all the same properties of the electron, but acted opposed to it. These anti-electrons were dubbed positrons, and are found from the aforementioned cosmic rays and beta decay. When an electron and a positron love each other very much, they slam into each other and produce two photons, a lot of energy, and they end their very short relationship in the heaviest way possible. And doesn't this sound a bit similar to how a certain stand functions? I mean, D4C has the ability to take something from an alternate reality and bring it into ours. Who's to say what he's bringing isn't what our universe considers antimatter? Now how are positrons able to exist in our universe despite being antimatter? It's particle annihilation caused by the electrons and positrons interacting that would make a hypothetical antimatter object in our world explode. Electrons and positrons don't have to interact. They can go about their days and keep existing. But if they're ever brought together, they cannot remain around. The product is light and energy in the form of gamma radiation. All the particles that annihilate must be the exact opposite to each other. And that's why a hypothetical character from a different reality could exist in our base reality in the air and on the ground and be totally fine. The universe needs to balance itself out and exploding things is a dirty cheap way to get those dirty deeds done.
<gasps> Thank you so much for watching. After summarizing 400 years of physics in one video, all I can say is that's kind of cool. It's so fascinating learning about how the world works, and it's honestly the reason I started this series. This episode definitely went the deepest on concepts, so if you ever want to learn more, I implore you to check out information on any of these topics. It's hard to top a stand science like this one, so for the next one, we'll be a lot more grounded in whatever weird and wacky abilities Araki made. Have a beautiful doing, and I'll see you all next time.